Last night, both uh, Mr. Dumb and Mr. Raleigh gave you some good instruction on concert masterclass etiquette and a little bit of worship etiquette to encourage you. I think one of the most meaningful parts of chapel for me is coming a bit early and listening to the prelude. It's not perfunctory. It's really, really important. Thank you so much, Lauren, and all that contribute to that. And I really encourage you to come a bit early and sit and kind of prepare your uh, spirit to meet uh, God. And also, I just love it that you ladies sit right there in the front. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, tomorrow. <laughs> I love that. Uh, let's turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, just eight verses, verses 1 to 8 of Matthew chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Lord, as we come to this text, it's so powerful. I pray you would help us. Let the Holy Spirit give us understanding. Let the Holy Spirit guide us into the truths you have for us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now considering another intriguing encounter with Jesus as we are thinking about considering Jesus again, this time as it involves the trio friendship of Peter, James, and John. And I think this, in fact, is one of the most important passages in all of the New Testament in all of the Bible, as it so clearly and necessarily reveals to us the fullest expression of who this Jesus truly, ultimately is. But I want to begin this morning by telling you a wee story from my own life. When I was a wee child of 10 years old, some of you know that my parents were missionaries to the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa. My father was a medical doctor, my mother a teacher, and picked up nursing. So I grew up there, and at nine years of age, I went off to a boarding school called the American School of Kinshasa. It's still there. It's run by missionaries. And I fell in love for the first time with a beautiful young African-American girl who was a few years older than me. Her name was Vanessa Washington. She was a missionary child as well from Washington, D.C., and she was stunningly gorgeous, and I fell in love. And I was so happy to impress her because at the end of my second year, at 10 years of age, I had picked up trombone and a bit of singing and I apparently had a little bit of talent. So at the end of the year there was a big uh, awards ceremony and I was to receive an award for music making and I thought this will be my time to impress Vanessa and win her heart. 
I hardly ever wore long trousers, it was just shorts, it was hot Africa, hardly ever wore shoes, but we had to dress up for this occasion and I scrounged to find some proper trousers and they were a wee bit long, so the moment came for me to go get my award in front of Vanessa and all my good friends and I tripped over the f leggings of my trousers, they were too long and I fell flat on my face. <laughs> Vanessa never married me. No. <laughs> Aiden, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can come pray with me after, yeah. I'm still in Sardo. She never really paid me much attention because I kind of fell flat, you know, flat, flat on my face. I had to come to Chehi to meet Cynthia, who I married. And a few <laughs> byproducts are here. <laughs> One of them. <laughs> so it all is well. You can give great hope to who you might meet at Chehi. Although that's third or fourth area in your reason for being here, I'm sure. <laughs> Now that, of course, is a negative example of flat-on-your-face posture. While here in this grand narrative that we are looking at, it is occasioned by an awe-inspiring example of what it means to actually be prostrate before Christ, to be flat with your face in the dirt because of Jesus. Totally different scenario. It relates to the dual apex of this text. The text really has two different points of serious reference. First in the verse 2, where Jesus, we are told, was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. You have, to, you have to imagine it. You have to get into what was this scene. And then the other verse that draws this together, the effect of this on the disciples in verse 6. When they heard this, they fell face down to the ground terrified they were. Now, in good biblical study, we should always be considering how theology ought always to be moving to the so what. Here is one of the, in fact, I think it's the most important that theology puts before you. It's a simple question, so what? So many people read the Bible and actually never get to so what? overlooked this critical question of healthy, robust theology. We read, we grapple, we think we have understanding, but so what? What do you do with it? Particularly so when we're giving focused attention to Christ, Christology. I've used that term a few times. It's simply the study of Jesus, Christological study as is so clearly the case here in this passage and in all that we're looking at in these days together. Here we come to the so what in response of the disciples to the vision of Christ they are given in verse 6. When they heard this, they fell face down to the ground. Have you ever had that with Jesus where you just... Go to your face in the dirt out of recognizing who he is. So today I want us to examine this text for what lies behind this response of falling face down before Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe. Running up to this dramatic gesture on the part of the disciples is... Something so important that is always overlooked, at least in my studies of it. The unique intimacy of friendship that we find in the opening verses. 
that shows us the close uh, circle of friendship that existed between Jesus, Peter, James, and John. It's mentioned in verse 1, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Why does the text not tell us the others were included? There was this unique circle of friendship between Jesus and these three. The importance of this unique and intimate experience is underscored by Matthew's use of a grammatical tool that's quite important. It's called, it's a little bit technical, but bear with me, you're musicians, you have to do technique. This is the same in biblical study. It's a little bit technical, it's called the historic present in which the importance of a past event is highlighted by writing it in a way that is de deliberately meant to sound and read as in the present. And so this verse in Greek literally reads, six days later Jesus takes Peter and James and John and leads them up on a high mountain. English versions we translated Jesus took Peter, Jesus led them, but it's the historic present alerting us to how important this time of Jesus with these three, Peter, James, and John, really is. And of course, we can note the emphasis on that special bond as the verse concludes, kat idion, by themselves. Jesus took these three Matthew wants us to underscore by themselves. Wouldn't you want to be part of that trio? Boy, I would. Jesus, Peter, James, and Wesley. <laughs> Come on. Jesus, Peter, James, and Erickson. Cuban in there. <laughs> Get the international flavor, enough of these Israelis here. And we know that this trio of friends with Christ is seen actually all through the Gospels. All four of the Gospels record this special, unique relationship of Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Perhaps most pointedly, for example, in Mark's gap, Gospel chapter 5, verse 37, which reads, And he, Jesus, allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John. Dear young women, young men, faculty, staff, no matter what our age, among other things, Matthew, I'm sure, is reminding us of how critical intimate friendships are for growth in our spiritual development. And in this case, for recognizing actually the fullness of who Christ is. Don't overlook this of being a disciple of Jesus, Matthew draws attention to the importance of intimate, dependable, trustworthy friendships. It's not a slight thing. Who are your closest friends that move you to fall on your face before Jesus? And if you've been at Chehi Summer School for any years, you know how that comes through here, don't you? I look in this room and I see friendships that have been there for 30, 40, <laughs> I don't know, long time years. <laughs> Mr. Dumb mentioned his wife, Molly, who he married into Chehi through marrying Molly. I was. A student, when Molly first came, she was like a prodigy on the violin, so Wilmus Chehi allowed her way too young to come. I think she was only 11 years old. 
and she is my dearest friend as well as Brian to this day. They have shaped me. Floyd and Janet and Graham. I remember when Miss Brooks first came and astounded us with this youngster pounding away at the piano. And now she's perfected it to unbelievable finesse you'll hear tomorrow night. I'm so delighted to get to know Erickson and Andrew and others. These friendships, Lauren, they are important. It's in the text for a reason. Matthew wants you to take that seriously. These friendships you have through Chehi will really shape you if you allow the Holy Spirit to use them. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now, quite the contrast to that <clears throat> is another part of this prelude, another bit to the run-up to this face-down posture of the disciples that would certainly have been very prominent for Matthew's readers. And it's how the text again in verse 1 clearly recollects what we might call the Christ contra Satan theme. We see this when we note the extraordinary commonality of language between two very different mountain scenes in the Gospel of Matthew particularly. Common language that alerts us that this is no coincidence. Looking at our passage today, as it aligns with Matthew chapter 4 verse 8, you don't have to turn to it, I'll just explain to it. Here in Matthew 17, 1, we have the phrase, Eis horos hupselon, unto a high mountain he takes them. And in Matthew 4, 8, the very same, Eis horos hupselon, leon, unto a very high mountain. <laughs> the commonality of language says these are meant to correlate in our thinking. And we have to note how mountain settings in the Bible are very important for many supernatural encounters between God and human beings. For example, Mount Sinai, where God gives the law to Moses. Mount Carmel, where there's a confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Both Moses and Elijah show up in this story. Isn't that coincidental? Mount Olivet, where Jesus gives some of his most important eschatological future look teaching. And, of course, ultimate of all, Mount Calvary, where Jesus atones for sin and defeats the enemy. However, the scenes in these two high mountain settings highlighted by Matthew... Ice Horas Hupsaleon, a high mountain in Matthew 17. Ice Horas Hupsaleon Leon unto a very high mountain in Matthew 4 8. Are dramatically contrary, absolutely dramatically different. In the earlier text, Matthew 4, it is not Christ leading his inner circle of friends to a high mountain for a beatific revelation, but it is Satan leading Christ to a high mountain to tempt him with abuse of power. Worship me and I will give you the kingdoms of the world, Satan says to Jesus himself. But here in Matthew 17, it is so wonderfully purposed to reveal the fullness of Christ with the unveiling and restrictions of humanity pulled aside and allowing the essence of Christ's eternal being to come bursting through his face shining like the sun, his clothes as white as light. 
It is perhaps the earliest example of what is called in theological circles the Christus Victor theme of the New Testament, that the purposes of Christ and Satan are dramatically opposed, diametrically opposed, and the power of Christ manifested in the very ontological being of who he is overwhelmingly outshines the purposes of darkness and is always absolutely contra the very author of evil, the enemy of all that is good and loving and accord with God's purposes in the world. Don't make the theological fallacy, the theological error of blaming stuff on God. There is an enemy in the world that works contrary to the good, life-giving, eternal purposes of God, and his name is Satan. He's real. And sometimes in our overzealousness to stand on the sovereign purposes of God, we say God is responsible for the worst. This is a good theological term. Crap. <laughs> the worst evil that God abhors in his opposition to Satan and his purposes. I, I am so tired of hearing people say, well, God must have willed it. Are you kidding? He would will evil? No, he's in a battle. It is one at the cross, but still carrying on skirmishes. N.T. Wright, wonderful scholar, New Testament, and the whole Bible actually differentiates it so well when he writes that Satan's mountain is defined by abuse of power, Christ's mountain is defined by the authority of the eternal being of the Son of God. Authority of being rather than abuse of power. And young ladies, young men, all of us, I want to underscore the importance of understanding our world as it is and the reality of an enemy. This passage shows us not arbitrarily, not coincidentally, but Matthew's purpose is very clear. This is contra Satan. The reality of Jesus' superseding power that outshines the darkness, which is why his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Your very souls are being wrestled with by an enemy. But this passage reminds you Christ's light supersedes it all if you trust him, if you walk his way. One of the very best books I've had in the last year I brought along with me to show you, it's called The Unseen Realm. Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. We in the West don't take seriously the unseen world, the spiritual, supernatural, and it's all through the Bible. Michael Heisert is an incredible scholar and goes through every bit in the scripture about these realities of angels, but also demons, God's hosts, but also demonic forces. And though you grow up in traditions that try to downplay that, the Bible's full of it and helps you make sense of what's going on. Actually, I recommend it to you. Uh, come and look at it with me this week if you'd like. If you buy me a coffee. <clears throat> okay. 
We come then, of course, to the very first in the dual apex. Don't get worried, we're going to only do a bit of this today and come back and finish it tomorrow. I see the fear in your eyes. <laughs> the first in this dual apex of this magnificent text, the transfiguration itself, verse 2, we've already referred to. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. The text makes clear that Jesus very deliberately wanted Peter, James, and John, that trio of friendship, to see him, we could say, in a whole new light. To see him in new light. He wanted to expand their vision of who he is, really, with flesh taken away and heavenly power totally revealed. And it references one of the questions I got from some of you. Again, a number of you asked the same sort of question about seeking God, but not actually going through long periods of time where you don't seem to hear His voice in your life. It's a, such a good question. Two or three of you raised it. And I want to say that's so good. Keep seeking. Ask God to speak. But another side of it, clear from the supernatural world of the Bible is ask him for a vision. And it's here in the text. This Jesus, do you see this vision? It's for you to really grapple with Christ. But beyond that, in our work with Muslim peoples coming to faith, we pray for them that they will have a dream in which Jesus Christ comes and shows himself. And you wouldn't believe how many times that happens. So many Muslim peoples are meeting Jesus because he comes through a vision. And I think it's for us. It's not just for my Muslim friends. Grab it. Ask for it. But it's right here in the text. So at least start there. For a few brief moments, an awesome thing took place as the limitations of Jesus' humanity were set aside and his flesh succumbed to another part of his nature, which more often quaked, quaked beneath the surface. And the radiance of his essential heavenly glory burst through the finiteness of his humanity. And these three saw Jesus in the glory of his real person, total person. The word in the original text is metamorphose. Metamorphose, sound familiar? We get our English word metamorphosis from it, translated here, transfigured. And it means to change the form of something so that the substance of it is more clearly visible. And it is Matthew's way of saying that the underlying, sometimes hidden glory of Christ, always there, kind of quaking beneath and bursting out here and there through the gospel stories, the majesty, the power, the brilliance of his eternal being came bursting through at this moment This as well as the marred humanness of Christ on the cross is the real Jesus. This and the Christ disfigured so that Isaiah says no one could even recognize him is the real Jesus, both aspects. If you're going to be a Christian, you must be serious about Christology. Study Jesus. Study Him. Matthew adds that Moses and Elijah appeared with him to ensure that we fully comprehend that Jesus had indeed traversed all the bounds of time and space and Moses and Elijah 
in a supernatural domain, reappear with him. We're going to talk more about Moses and Elijah tomorrow and the representation they bring of the law and the prophets. But here, what is their point? We can conclude with this. In the end of the story, Moses is not there. When they looked up, verse 8, they saw no one except Jesus. In the end, God's purposes in Moses and the law point to only Jesus. In the end, God's purposes in Elijah and all the prophets point to Christ. There's no one else. They point to Jesus. A Christological focus for you, for me, is not just a theological novelty or an optional preference for the mo more devout followers, but all the purposes of God, the very purpose and goal of all creation, according to the Apostle Paul, the very purpose and goal of all creation is to point to Jesus, the Son of God. Now we're going to come back to this passage tomorrow and look much more depth at some other very important bits, tie it all up together. But for now, I want us to conclude with a, a moment of silent reflection. And then Graham's going to come and lead us in a glorious hymn of Jesus. Jesus shall reign. Where'er the sun does its successive journeys run, his kingdom from shore to shore. Before we sing that, I want to just ask you to take a minute of silence and ask yourself this question. How might your life look and feel differently if you truly believe that all the purposes of God in all of creation point to Christ. So what? All of God's goals and purposes according to the New Testament for the whole of His creation purpose point to this Jesus. So what? For you. How will your life look and feel differently if you really believe that. Just one minute of silence, then we'll sing. Lord God, we would confess that this passage just is mesmerizing. It's hard to put ourselves in this place of Peter, James, and John to experience Christ transfigured. His face shining like the sun, bright and blinding to our eyes, and his clothes as white as light. Help us to focus on Christ. Help us to be Christological in our living. And help us to think today about so what? Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Graham will lead us. <clears throat> 231.